you got to be like, I guess the samurai have this saying that you want to be like bamboo, you bend, but you don't break. And then also that he would say is, um, I guess is also saying in samurai, like expect nothing, be ready for everything. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who enjoys watching basketball, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 105 of the Running Thrill podcast. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I have a wonderful interview for you lined up and I'm really excited about it. Last week, we had motivating and inspiring Justin Gallegos, the first professional athlete with cerebral palsy, who secured a sponsorship from Nike of all brands. If you watched that video about his story late last year and tears flowed from your eyes like they did from mine, this interview will just be amazing to hear. And if you listened last week, I hope you really enjoyed it. And I hope you tweeted at Joe Rogan to see if we can get Justin on his show, as that would be Justin's dream. Now today I have the US half marathon record holder and 204, no big deal, marathoner Ryan Hall on the show. Ryan is one of the household names in our sport and has had quite the journey both during his career and afterwards. I got to ask Ryan all the questions I've wondered about and we talked a bit about his new book, Run the Mile You Are In. And there's a lot of answers from my questions in the book as well. Now, just a quick note, growing up in England, religion was never really a part of my experience. In the UK, religion is kind of something that you keep to yourself. It was quite an adjustment for me being here in the US with people being so outwardly passionate about their faith. But being British, I still feel a little bit uncomfortable talking about it in any capacity, to be totally honest with you. And I hope that doesn't offend you in any way. But for me, In this interview, I mostly talked about Ryan's career, running career that is, rather than his faith. If your faith is important to you, this book will definitely be for you as it is clearly a very important part of Ryan's life. But I just wanted to give you the heads up as to why I didn't talk about that too much in this interview. One more thing before we go to meet our sponsors and get to the episode. If you're going to be in Boston on April 14th, I would love to meet you. Yeah, like in person, like get a hug and all. Send me an email, tina at tinamuir.com, and I will let you know more of the details. I hope to see you there. Let's go meet Ryan. This episode is sponsored by Aftershocks, the award-winning headphone brand, best known for its open-ear listening experience, powered by patented best-in-class bone conduction technology. Aftershocks headphones sit outside your ear so you can hear your music and your surroundings. I know. Aftershocks is a must-have for runners, providing the ultimate level of safety and comfort without compromising sound quality. To learn more and save $50 on Aftershocks endurance bundles, visit tina.aftershocks.com. That's T-I-N-A dot A-F-T-E-R-S-H-O-K-Z dot com. Thank you to our friends at Generation You Can for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. You can get 15% off at generationyoucan.com when you use code Tina Muir. Go get yourself some, especially the peanut butter bars. They are the best. Go get some. Ryan, thank you so much for joining me on the Running For Real podcast. I am really excited to have you here today. And thank you so much for giving me some time to, to talk. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Tina. Looking forward to our chat. Yeah, this is going to be fun. And I told you before I uh, started this episode, and uh, my listeners already know that I really do try and get very deep with questions, thinking about, uh, you know, making sure that you've got some unique ones, because as I'm sure you know, podcasts and interviews can get quite monotonous at times with people asking the same questions. So we're going to try and give you some interesting ones. But starting off, uh, you know, you have the US half marathon record of 59.43. You're a 204 marathoner, Olympian. But I wanted to go back to uh, the day you started running uh, with a 15 mile run with your father, um, which is the start kind of early on in your book, Run the Mile You're In, that we're going to talk about a lot today. 
And I liked reading that because it showed you were very real and raw with where you were on that run, that it wasn't natural and easy to just go out for a 15 mile run. And I think many people listening probably forget that you're, even though you're Ryan Hall, you still started somewhere. So maybe tell us or tell the listeners a little bit about um, that, that day you just, you know, essentially decided to start running and how 15 miles didn't just come naturally to you as, as many would maybe expect. Yeah, I'm, it's crazy how one moment, you know, as 13 just totally changed the trajectory of my life. You know, it would have been very easy for me to just kind of pass off that, you know, I, I think of it as like a inspiration from God, but to just pass that off as being like nothing, you know, not acting on it. But I'm so grateful that I did act on it because it changed where I went to college, it changed who I ended up marrying. It changed the kids that I would eventually have. It changed, you know, the whole trajectory of my life was totally changed from that moment when I was 13 years old. So I just like to encourage people, like, even if you're young and you feel like the decisions you're making aren't that big to still like take them seriously and realize that sometimes even the smallest decisions can actually like shape the trajectory of your life even more than the big ones. Um, so that's kind of my first thing with that, with that moment was just like looking back on now, just being kind of blown away of being like, man, it's so powerful. Even when we're young, just the little decisions we're making. And related to that. So, you know, these small decisions that make a big difference in our life, how can someone listening kind of know what that feels like? You know, especially if it is, like you said, small, you have a lot of small decisions and how do you know kind of which ones to, to listen to and which ones to kind of essentially just make a quick decision and get on with it. Yeah. I think for myself, a lot of it just falls back on like, what's the vision for my life and is this decision in alignment with the vision for my life. And so even like the, at that point, that point I did not have a strong, well, my vision for my life was being a professional baseball player. That, mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to do, you know? Um, but so I, I wouldn't say, you know, that choice to run around the lake necessarily aligned with that vision of trying to play professional baseball, but there was also too, just something about it that just really captured me. And so I just encourage people to like, pay attention to those things that it just like grabs you. And you're just like, I just got to experience this or try this or like, you know, things that the, you know, the talk about like being in a flow state where you lose track of time that you're doing, like pay attention to those things. Cause those are things that you maybe you're created to do, um, or experience. So, um, yeah, that's kind of so how, what I think with look. that, you said that like, you know, kind of a flow state or, or getting that like strong tug in your heart. But then when you were out there in that 15 miles, you was, you were struggling, like you were having a hard time, had your dad, thankfully could read the sign and knew to, to stop you and, and have you kind of take breaks and stuff. But how did you kind of keep going with that momentum or what would you encourage someone to do if maybe they get the strong tug to do something, but then they start it and it's hard or maybe they feel like they're failing or they're not very good at it? Yeah, that's such a hard question to answer, you know, because everyone's experiences, like there are some things that like you try and that you should stop and not mm -hmm. do, you know, <laughs> like there, it's not like every single thing you try in life, you need to try and like never or ever give up in anything. Like that's not even realistic. Like you couldn't even do that in your life, you know? So you got to know which things you need to push through the pain you need to push through and the things that you got to be like, Hey, you know, this isn't for me. Like, and so, uh, for me, yeah, I was really struggling with that run around the lake, lots of stops, lots of blisters took forever. felt like I was out there for days. How running, long you were know, you out there? Did you, did you ever figure that out? No, no, we never timed it, but yeah, that was before the day of like, you know, Garmin and <laughs> um, tracking stuff like that. So okay. we don't have any data on that run, but I guarantee you it was, it, it was at least, at least two and a half to three hours, okay. maybe, maybe longer. <laughs> it was, it was, it was very, very painful. But also what I kind of learned is that, um, on that one thing that really makes me tick is like, I love challenges. I love pushing myself. And so even though it was super, super hard and not necessarily fun, like I wasn't really having a good time out there. And even when I finished, I, I wouldn't say like, I finished me like that was so much fun. I want to go do that again. But there was this like sense inside of me of like, this just 
ticked a box of like what makes me me, mm-hmm. which is like just loving to push myself. Yeah. So it's kind of like the more you know yourself, the more easy it is to act on these different ideas or inspirations or to know which things you should push through. Cause it's like, if this is what makes you, you, then like, how can you not continue on with it? Mm-hmm. I love that. And, you know, you mentioned the kind of knowing yourself and you talked a lot, um, about, struggling at times with others' achievements kind of affecting your own self-worth. And this is something we deal with on a daily basis, essentially, um, feeling like a failure when we're looking at other people's journeys. And social media doesn't really help with this situation. But looking back now, what would be your advice to others when it comes to kind of, you know, looking at others and maybe you've had a good race, but then you see someone else has had a better race and you think, oh, well, maybe mine wasn't so good. What would be your advice? Yeah, I would encourage you. So this is kind of like a core value of, um, where we used to live in Redding, California, the church we attended Bethel church, um, kind of a core value is like celebrating other people's victories. Mm -hmm. So we believe that when you celebrate other people's victories, it enables you to walk into your own victory. Like there's just something about that. And I don't, I don't know if I could completely articulate it, but it's not what I feel like doing, you know, like when I see my editors, my peers go pop a big race or beat a time that I had previously recorded, whatever it's not, I'm not, that's not my natural reaction, you know, but it, it has to be like a choice that I make and being like, I'm going to, whenever I talk about this person and what they just did, I'm going to talk about like, man, that was so amazing. I'm so excited for them. Even though like deep down inside, I'm not totally there yet, but the more like it's kind of the fake it till you make it. You know, like the more I do that, it really does work. Take some time. Like it doesn't work the first time, but you know, after talking to 10 people about what Alan Webb just did in the mile and how incredible that was, um, after the 10th, 20th time, kind of like, yeah, you know know what? That was really amazing. I can appreciate that. And I can draw inspiration from that. That doesn't just because his value went up as a runner doesn't mean my value went down. Mm -hmm. For sure. And thank you for explaining that. Cause I think that is, it's also good for people to hear that from you. That is something we all deal with. And I know a lot of people listening struggle with that. And so going on deeper into your book, uh, so run the mile you're in finding God in every step. Um, tell us about the decision to write a book. Was that something you always planned on doing or was it just something that kind of an opportunity came up and you thought, you know what, I'm going to do this. Yeah. You know, Tom Dean from Zondervan, he's uh, the VP of marketing there. And he's also an avid runner, like mm. really good. And so he had emailed me back and I believe it was 2010. And he's like, Hey, you should oh. like write a book. But that was still like in the middle of my journey is before the 2012 Olympics. And, um, just the timing didn't feel right. It didn't feel like that season had ended. Mm-hmm. And then after I ran the seven marathon, seven days, seven continents, um, there was a real sense of closure with that. Mm-hmm. And with that sense of closure, it kind of launched me into this new phase of my life, which to be honest, I can't say like, I was sure I was going to go in this direction of like coaching, writing, speaking. It's kind of like the, the path that most pro pro runners take, you know, but, and I, now I understand why they take that path because like for me, like I spent 20 years running and trying to reach my maximum potential. And that was my craft. That was my passion. That's what I was good at. And so it, it doesn't really make sense to completely can all of that and just move on to something completely different when like, that's what I know. That's what I'm good at. That's how I can help other people. Mm -hmm. And so it it just kind of launched me into that um, season of wanting to help other people. And writing is obviously um, a big way and that can reach a big audience and share my story with them. I love that. I kind of, when you were saying about launching in something else, I had a vision. Have you seen the, the Incredibles, the movie? Uh, it's been a while <laughs> where the guy, um, Mr. Incredible ends up working in the insurance department and he's just like stamping papers and hates it. That's kind of why I envisioned you just doing that right there. Um, but one thing that I love that was different about, um, your book was the way that you laid it out. So you tell us about kind of the chapters and, and what are the, the titles of the chapters mean? Cause that was such a unique way of, of writing a book and I loved it. Uh, thanks. Well, that, I can't take complete credit for that. You know, like I, I wrote the book completely myself. There's no ghost writer or anything, but I did have some good editors. And so that was actually one of the 
editor's idea to lay it out like a, a mile for every chapter. And so, um, that was, that was brilliant on her part to recognize that and, and pull that out. Um, but so like when I was writing the book myself, I kind of was just going through my story and trying to pull out like, what were the most like life changing lessons I experienced through mm-hmm. running and talking about those experiences, sharing those experiences with people. Yeah. And, and it was, it was great to read that. And I, I learned a lot of things I didn't know, which was really cool. And we'll encourage people to, to go get yourself a copy. And, um, you know, you've, you've made it clear over, over the years that your faith is very important to you and it's a strong theme throughout the book. Um, so, you know, you talked a lot about uh, having a connection, especially in your most important races, not even necessarily your biggest success races, but just most important to you. So, uh, and another thing, it introduced you to your wife, Sarah, as you mentioned earlier. So tell us about while you were training, how did you manage to stay balanced with, you know, having a family, having your training, having your faith and, and essentially having some kind of like a social life just to be you know, a, a normal person, essentially, how did you find time for it all? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's as a pro runner, it's not a very balanced life. No. It's just not. You know? <laughs> uh, so like, this was prior to us having kids, you know, like mm-hmm. when we adopted our girls, I tried to run, keep running, but my body was just giving out on me. And I was really bummed about that. Cause my kids really wanted to see me run at my best. And I really wanted them to see me run at my best, but it just wasn't in the cards anymore. So I ended up, you know, retiring shortly after we adopted them, but it's kind of unrelated to that. But all that to say, like before that our life was pretty, I don't know. It less glamorous than you'd think as a professional athlete. You know, there was a <laughs> lot of time just like kind of bored to be honest, you know, like watching chops, like on repeat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and you're just hunkered down in a small mountain town training at altitude and focused on, on yourself. So yeah. like that's that, I think it's okay to have a season of life like that. And for me, like that was my season, but I don't think, it's a sustainable and fulfilling way to live long term. So, you know, I'm grateful for my time, my season, but I'm also grateful now to be in a new season and, um, be able to focus more on other people than, um, being self-absorbed. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny you say that. Cause that's always what I explained. I did one summer of just, just doing the running thing, um, seeing what I could do. A, I had a terrible race at Chicago and B, I just hated it because I just couldn't handle it just being about me and my running all the time. So um, totally get it. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to cover that you talked about a lot is um, expectations. Uh, you know, in your running and in your life, you spent a lot of your time trying to to prove yourself potentially. And that's a common theme for this show. So for someone listening, um, you know, you talked about uh it's important that you make some sacrifices. Like you mentioned, you wanted to be a baseball player, but when you really committed to your running, you even got offered a spot on the team uh, or to try out. I can't remember, um, but you turned it down because you knew that you wanted to focus on your running. So how do you find the balance between sacrificing things? You know, I need to get my eight hours sleep so I can't go out for a party or whatever it may be, but then not having expectations of what you're going to do at performance wise when you re- make those sacrifices. Yeah, that's it. That's a great question. Um, and it, it kind of goes back to like what we were talking about earlier about like having some kind of balance in mm-hmm. your life. And I think that's just like a moment by moment, like decision that you got to make, you know, like you got to just have priorities and know what your priorities are. And, and if so, like, for example, if your priorities are family and you're on, you know, it's Christmas with the family or whatever, and it's 10 o'clock at night and you should be in bed, but everyone's playing games and you decide to stay up playing games to realize like, Hey, this is a big priority for me. And this isn't my normal, but like, I'm willing to bend and flex. And that's something that was always really hard for me during my career. Like I was very rigid which did not serve me well in the long term. Um, so I wish that I would have been able to bend and flex more. And, and as you're like talking about expectations, I was remembering, um, what Terrence Mahan, my coach at the mammoth track club would tell me on the starting line of races. So you'd say like, you got to be like, I guess the samurai have this saying that you want to be like bamboo, you bend, but you don't break. Mm. And then also the, you would say is, um, uh, this, I guess is also saying in samurai, like 
expect nothing, be ready for everything. Hmm. And that just really helped me because I know like on the starting line of races, no matter how training's going, we always have this like firm, like vision of it's going to play out exactly like this. And then when it's not playing out that way, like I would, I would mentally crumble, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I found out it's much better on the starting line. If I was like, could go this way, could go that way, but really I'm just not going to expect anything to happen, but I'm be ready for a variety of scenarios. And that just enabled enabled me to, yeah, kind of not crumble when things weren't panning out the way Mm -hmm. I wanted. And what about someone listening who thinks, okay, but then I'm going to go into kind of a a crisis situation and and, and panic and and be really fearful of the race. Anything else you would say to that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. (laughs) Uh, that goes back to like your, your preparation and trusting yourself, you know? And I talk about that a lot with my athletes now. It's like, if you're prepared And then you got to just trust your instincts to some extent, you know, Mm -hmm. and then you also have to have grace for yourself to fail and have that be okay. Like that is huge. Mm -hmm. Like if you can be okay with the fact that you might fail, because like I'd make decisions all the time in races. I, I didn't know for sure if it was going to work out or not. Like, I'm just like going with my gut, with my instincts. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it, I just blew up and it was terrible. Mm-hmm. So I, I, but I got to the point in my career was, I was okay with that. It's like, it's, you know what, sometimes I'm going to mess up and that's, that's part of being human. And mm-hmm. I need to have myself to, to make mistakes. I think in some ways that also comes with essentially like years of running experience. Like you kind of have to just kind of earn your way there of being nervous and being scared and all these different emotions and putting too much pressure on and failing and not and all that kinds of stuff. So, um, if you are in that state right now to someone listening, just, you know, try and listen to our words, but they may not go in. It may just be something you have to learn yourself over time. Okay. So let's talk about, you know, you coach now, as you mentioned earlier, but one thing that I really like about you is that you find it important to get to know someone as a person, what they're like outside of running, what they like outside of running. Um, and again, going back to, you know, a lot of runners end up getting their identities tangled in, in running and need to beat other people or run a certain time to feel valuable. What would be your advice for someone listening who maybe does struggle with finding things outside of the run of running that they tend to define themselves on and, and why it is important to kind of get to know themselves and and be who they are. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head with, with what you're saying about knowing who they are, you know, like that's, that's kind of where all this stems from and why, like I do have that approach with my athletes where I got to know what makes them tick. So like, for example, with Sarah, it's, it's easy for me because I'm married to her. So I know what makes her tick, you know, but like, she loves, she loves traveling. She loves racing. And so that's just like part of who she is. So that means like, we need to do some like untraditional approaches to some marathons, um, that most pros don't do. Like for example, when she ran, um, what marathon was it in the spring, uh, last spring. And then she doubled back and ran CIM like a month later. I'm totally blanking on it right now, but Chicago? I should know that. As well. no, it wasn't nice. New York? It's it. Ottawa. It's Ottawa. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, that's just like, that's what makes Sarah tick. So it kind of goes back to what you're saying. Like you have to know yourself and then plan accordingly to who you are, you know, and be true to who you are. Mm-hmm. And that's something that helped me kind of transition out of running was realizing, like I was mentioning earlier, when we were chatting about like knowing that I just love challenges. I love to push myself. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to find another avenue that met that part of who I was through weight training, um, that allowed me to transition out of running, uh, way better than I otherwise would have. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I want to get into that a bit more in a, in a little while, but for, for now, one other thing that's, uh, stood out to me that I thought was one of your biggest strengths, but also something that most people listening, I know struggle with, which is kind of having a belief in yourself. And you said, uh, you talked about in your book about, um, success breeds success, but what happens if you don't experience the success that starts the string of positive thoughts and belief in yourself? So what was your kind of, um, combat to that for someone listening who is thinking that exact thing? Yeah, it kind of, you know, for myself, it went back to that original vision of like, 
believing that God had told me when I was 13, that I was going to one day run with the best people in the world. Mm -hmm. I fell back on that over and over and over again. Cause you know, my circumstances more often than not, were not confirming that belief, you know, like they were showing that that was not going to happen actually. So there was many, many moments where I felt like stopping. And I was like, I, I'm through with running. Like I've had enough of this, but I always fall back on that, that moment when I was 13 and that vision and, and believing that vision that I felt like God gave me for my life that one day run with the best guys in the world. And that just enabled me to keep moving forward and to have something to where like, I'm not stopping until I see this come true in my life. And I know that there's going to, and I talk about this a lot in my book. Like I know that the road to achieving that vision is just going to be full of failure. Like, and that failure is essential to the process. So like for people who are like maybe going through that failure, maybe doubting themselves a little bit. Um, if you can, go back to whatever vision you might have for your life and that, that kind of original inspiration. Can you go back and can you fall on that? And if you can't, I would encourage you to, and this helped me a lot throughout my career to surround yourself with people who can speak good things into your life and can call out what they see and tell you what your talents and abilities are and remind you of the journey that you're on. Like that is huge. Like yeah. I would have never got to where I got to if I didn't have Sarah and my parents and friends and teammates and coaches like constantly like reminding me, like, like you are going somewhere with this, like stay on the course, keep moving forward. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because that was another thing I love that you said that if you can't find this thing for yourself, if you can't find what makes you tick, what makes you special, what your gifts are, you know, ask the people around you, ask the people closest to you. Uh, I think that's an important point to mention because a lot of people listening are maybe thinking, well, I don't know how to find that. So ask ask the people that you care about because they may, may have an idea themselves. Um, and then you also mentioned about it you know, that what well, you said earlier about, uh, fake it till you make it kind of thing. Say, you know, I am mentally tough or I, I loved one thing that you said was changing. I'm not very good at this to I'm working to become strong at this. So just a quick change of perspective, anything you would like to add to that about that particular kind of area? Yeah. Yeah. Like one of the questions I get the most, uh, when I'm talking to other runners is like, how do I become a mentally strong runner? And I see this as a big problem in our sport where mm -hmm. like people start questioning themselves and worse yet, like coaches start questioning their athletes mm -hmm. and questioning their mental capabilities. And I'm not saying like athletes can't grow in mental capacity and, you know, being able to handle more and stuff. And I'm not saying there's not a mental component to it. I'm just saying that if you believe you're mentally weak as a runner, like you're going to act that way, Absolutely. like you're going to see more of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's like the first, like, shifting point is like believing like fine. And, and you go, it's okay to be honest with yourself. You know, you don't got to believe like I am the strongest <laughs> mental tough runner in the world uh -huh. or whatever, but like find something that is true. That's maybe small about who you are being like, you know what? I'm really good at like pushing at the second mile of the marathon or whatever it might be, you know, <laughs> and, and, and building off of that reality, you know, cause Cause yes, we can fake it till we make it, but we also need to like realize that yes, there are also things that we're struggling with and it's okay to struggle with those things, but that is not who you are. You know, like I am not bad at math. I'm just currently struggling with mm -hmm. math because I'm working at it and I'm, you know, learning. Mm -hmm. For sure. And, and as you, you mentioned multiple times, um, throughout your book, you said about trying harder, um, often makes things worse and, and we need to relax more. And uh, I think that is important because going on from this, someone who might think that they are mentally weak or they're struggling will kind of uh, essentially, like we said, try harder, dig down deep, uh, grimace, make a grimace with their face, like, look how hard I'm pushing myself. Um, what did you find about kind of learning to relax and trying to, you know, work with your body rather than fight it and kind of be like, I've got to dig, dig down deep. <laughs> well, first I, say I, I was not very good at that. <laughs> but, and that's why like a lot of things I write about in the book, like I was not, the reason why I'm writing about it is because I wasn't good at it. And I, yeah. just, what, I had to learn to be better at it, you know, and, and I didn't always master those things, but it was something that helped me a lot when I got better at it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, like 
with, with this, I remember when I was in high school and training, trying to break four minutes for the mile, I was um, working with Irv Ray and he was telling me, he's like, let the training come to you. Mm-hmm. And cause he could tell, like, I'm just out doing 10 by 400 and like nearly like getting sick and like going as deep into the well as I can go and, you know, not seeing great results from those kind of efforts in training. And he, him just reminding me like, Hey, like this is just supposed to flow out of you. It just, when I, when that was happening in training, like for example, before I ran 59 minutes in the half marathon, like I was running workouts that like were blowing my mind that Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand, Mm -hmm. but it was just like coming out. Like I wasn't trying, I wasn't like, I'm going to go harder than I've ever gone before on this eight mile tempo run. Just like, I I just couldn't help myself. It was just coming out of my body. So, um, that's something I struggle with throughout my career, but those times when I was able to connect with my body and just let the fitness come out rather than trying to force it to happen, I responded so much better to that style of training than, um, the mentality of just like more miles, harder, 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 go to the well. Um, so you just, there's story after story I could tell you about throughout my career of, of times when, when I was pushing too hard and, mm-hmm. and going too intense in workouts and it just, it never worked. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I, um, went, definitely went through a few stages where, um, I felt like unless I fell to the ground on my knees after every workout, then I wasn't running hard enough, not realizing that when it came to race day, you have nothing left. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I think we've all gone through that stage and it's good to hear you say that of all people as known as someone who, you know, was tough and could dig down deep. So that leads in quite nicely to, you kind of, uh, went towards the end of your career towards, uh, faith-based coaching. And in that you mostly kind of, uh, essentially backed off some things. You learned that you didn't need to push yourself as hard. You didn't need to kind of grind everything out. So tell us a bit about, um, for someone listening who just heard what you just said there about, uh, not going so hard, but they're thinking, yeah, but if I want to be able to push myself in races, if I want to be mentally strong, then I need to do it in my training. Um, why is that not necessarily the case? I just think you need to build in rest, you know, um, cause I think a lot of these people with the same type of personality or mentality that I had of like push harder, train harder, mm-hmm. um, we're not building in rest into the program. And then the body just cannot sustain the kind of effort that you're putting out every day. And it's just slowly breaking down. So that was one of the first things I felt like God was telling me when I went out on faith-based coaching was to rest, which I did not like hearing that. Like, it takes more confidence to rest than to train like an animal, Absolutely. like way more confidence. Mm-hmm. And that was really difficult for me because like deep down inside, I'm like, eh, like I'm, I have a certain level of talent, but really like, it's just cause I work super, super hard and I work harder than anyone else, you know? So, but when you can't fall back on that belief and you're like, oh, actually I'm not working harder than anyone else anymore, you know? And I'm, I'm resting more and it feels bad. I feel feel like I'm being lazy. I didn't like my days off, you know, I felt like something was amiss in my life and I wasn't getting the endorphin rush and like, I, I didn't like it, but it worked. Um, building that rest preventatively into the program, it actually allowed me to push harder the rest of the week because I knew that rest day was coming. I knew I was going to be able to recharge my batteries on that day. And then the next six days I could train like way harder and better so that was one of the big shifts that changed, um, from going from Mammoth Track Club to faith-based coaching is I started doing everything on six days instead of seven days, mm-hmm. which might not seem like a lot to like, uh, everyday runner, but to a pro runner, it's like reducing your volume by one seventh. That's a lot. Absolutely. And so that was a big shift for me. But, um, you see that with a lot of other pro runners who have aged very well. Um, guys like Bernard Lagat, for example, who always just trained on six days. You see that like that, that just little bit of extra rest can make a lot, a big difference in, in your, both your performances and also in your longevity in the sport. Yeah. Well, and even just from the, the mental aspects, uh, point of view, since I've, uh, had my daughter, I've been on six days a week and, like you said, it feels like a kind of a reset every week. You, you get that time to be like, all right. Um, I, and kind of almost look forward to the, the day off to kind of have that day to just reset. So it is a mental part of it as well. And, um, I just wanted the listeners to hear that because I think it is important to hear you say that 
it's not necessarily about pushing harder, harder, harder. So on that note, you, you did this faith-based coaching and, uh, you know, you, others may have seen it as unsuccessful with, you know, what you did after that, but you don't see it that way. So tell us why. Yeah. I mean, number one, like ran 204 right off the bat <laughs> going off that. So, <laughs> kind of uh, a statement. <laughs> yeah, that was I had a pretty good race afterwards. Um, and then, you know, running 208 in Chicago on a warm day and making my second Olympic team, all of that was on faith-based coaching. And it really like, you know, having lived the journey myself, I can just see that like, um, you know, I got plantar fasciitis prior to the 2012 Olympic trials and battled that, that just set me off on a string of, mm-hmm. of injuries that were kind of unavoidable. Like I can't take six months off for plantar fasciitis or a year off for that. Um, I had to train through it. I had to run the Olympic trials. I had to run the Olympic games. And, uh, so, you know, there's nothing I could have done differently in that situation, but that just, yeah, started a whole, just ridiculous string of injuries. And I never had a whole lot of injuries in my career. So, um, you know, that, that was a very difficult season for me to navigate. And really I would say, you know, is my faith that helped me, navigate that season in in my eyes as well as I did, you know, the performances for sure like, kind of stopped after 2012. And like I said, it was just a downward spiral from there, but, um, I don't necessarily attribute that to the training or to, you know, the faith-based coaching. I just look at it as like, my body was like, you've been doing hundred miles a mm. week since the time you were 16 years old. And now you're 33, like, there's, there's nothing left for my body to give me, you know? So, and it's, it's a unfortunate reality that kind of all professional runners will experience where eventually like whether it's injury or just slowing down, like we all, we all slow down, you know, it happens at different times and, uh, it's, it's not meant to last forever for anyone. And so, you know, that was kind of my time in 2016, looking back at the last four years and just realizing, you know, it, there was just nothing left. My body didn't have anything more to give. And, um, at that time I was realizing, you know, I've reached my full potential and there's, there's nothing left, uh, to go after. So, um, that's when it kind of was my time to step away from the sport. And were you okay with that? When you finally said to Sarah or whoever it was that you talked to first, okay, you know, I, I'm stopping or, you know, I'm done with this. How, how was you, your emotional state when you finally like said the words out, out loud? Yeah, that's a great question. I, it's actually a sense of relief, um, oh, yeah. to be honest, you know, mm-hmm. like I had been trying so hard, like trying as hard as I'd ever tried before and, um, being as disciplined as I'd ever been before and, training in Ethiopia and going to great lengths, seeing specialists to try and get my injuries figured out and stuff. And just nothing was working. And I I also worked with like quite a few different coaches during that time too. And, and none of their programs were working for me either. So, um, I just felt like I was hitting my head against the wall for, for four years. And so when I finally was like, okay, that's enough. Like it's time to move on. There's actually a, a big sense of like relief of like, okay, now I can look back. I can just appreciate and be thankful for everything that I did get to experience and, uh, and move on with my life. Oh, I hear you a hundred percent. Now you don't know my story, but it's very similar to the what, what exact everything you just said right there. I, my listeners have heard me talk about in that same way. And was there any part of you maybe, you know, a few years on, on I guess it would be now still, but um, maybe last year that was like an inkling of, oh, I wonder if I should have kept going or did you feel complete peace and still do now with the decision to stop when you did? both. I felt complete peace and still do, but like, I still like have moments where I'm like, I bet I can get back in shape. You know? <laughs> and I've actually had a couple of times where like I started training for like a month or two and then kind of got experienced the exact same thing I was experiencing before with kind of like extreme fatigue and just mm-hmm. feeling like I was into the ground just being like, this is why I stopped. <laughs> like it was a good decision. But yeah, yeah, like I, I definitely like have my moments, but also it makes it a little easier now that my body is completely different. So mm-hmm. being 185 pounds versus like I was at my best when I raced at 137 pounds. <laughs> like now the thought of getting back down to 137 pounds, I'm like, that is not going to be a fun process. <laughs> <I think I'll- laughs> 
No, I can imagine. Um, so on that note, uh, we've had an episode recently where we talked about um, red S or relative en- energy deficiency syndrome, uh, something that I definitely have had to work my way through um, in the in recent years. And um, this is a question from Sally, one of my Patreon members who wanted to know, you know, a lot of the um, things that you've talked about that you worked your way through or dealt with, or even just kind of the extreme fatigue kind of seems like it's the symptoms of red S in men. And I'm not sure if you've heard of this term or know about this term. Um, but do you feel like any part of you, if you had have heard of the term red S and if not, I can explain it, um, applied to you in those final years of your career? Yeah. Maybe explain to me a little bit about, yeah. so it's just kind of, um, basically not having enough calories coming in for the training that's going out. So women that often comes out as a lack of periods, which is what I had, but for, for men, it comes out in different ways, um, extreme fatigue, um, low testosterone, things like that. So, you know, looking back, do you think any part of it could have been fueling? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> okay. sure. And was that um, a conscious decision or just couldn't get enough in? Uh, it was a conscious decision, you know, like I kind of bought, I think I talk about this in my book. If I didn't, I should have, um, <laughs> about this like belief of in the pro running community of like lighter is always yep. faster. You yep. know? And I just kind of like bought into that, but previously I could never get down below like 137 pounds. Like that just seemed to be my body's being like no more than this. Like you're never going to get lighter than this. But then like later on in my career, I was able to get down even lower yeah. and I got down to even like 127 pounds. And I was so, I'm um, five of 10, 127 pounds. I was so weak and I looked super fit. Everyone's like, dang, you're going to like roll, you know? And I was running terrible, like Mm -hmm. the worst I had ever run. I think I ran like a 69 or 70 minute half marathon, maybe even slower than that in my last half marathon before I retired. And, you know, it, I was kind of like trying out some things. Like I was saying over the last four years, things had been getting worse and worse. So you start thinking, well, maybe like if I weigh five pounds less, Mm -hmm. that will help. You know? but it's, it's easy for me to look back at it now and be like, yeah, I was definitely way under fueled and very weak. And I can even look back at like pictures, for example, like picture of me crossing the finish line in Houston, where I ran 59 minutes look a lot different than some of my post 2012 marathon attempts, like the Boston marathon when mm-hmm. Meb won that year, I was also like just too light, too lean, too, I was just weak. And hormonally, I was, I was really off hormones or it's, that's a hard, a tricky thing to balance for for professional athletes. Their training is super, super high, you know, like it's just, that's a really tricky thing that it's, it's hard to naturally have like normal testosterone levels as Mm -hmm. a pro male marathon runner, no matter kind of what, what your weight is. It's just really hard on the system. So, um, that's why, like I always took two week breaks after Mm -hmm. every marathon, try and kind of reset myself hormonally more than anything. And I'd also put on a lot of weight in that time frame. And I think that was something that kind of shifted after 2012 as I stopped doing that. Mm -hmm. I stopped like these two week breaks and putting on literally I put on 10 pounds in two weeks. Like it was like donut eating competition for two weeks. (laughs) Um, seems like a really unhealthy thing to do. And it felt really unhealthy. Like, to be honest, I felt like all this shame with that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but it worked. And anytime I didn't do that, my next marathon was terrible. And I think there's, there's healthier ways to go about doing that. I don't encourage any listeners go like do a two week donut eating competition. Um, but like there should be times in your training, especially if you're like getting down to really lean levels where you put on a decent amount of weight. And I think you can do that by eating healthy foods and not like putting a bunch of junk in your body. That would be the better way to go about mm-hmm. doing that. Just, you, you just can't stay on that razor's edge, you know, all year round, year after year. It's not, not sustainable. Oh, I, I hear you. <laughs> I definitely have, uh, have kind of come to terms with that myself. And, and Ryan, when I, uh, I stopped running and tried to gain weight intentionally. And I think I, I think I gained either 15 or 20 in, six or eight weeks. Cause I just went for it. Like you said, <laughs> with donuts and everything, but uh, mine wasn't so much donuts. I think it was more ice cream and pancakes and things, but, um, 
anyway, like you said, there are kind of essentially better ways to do it, but sometimes, you know, needs must. And, and that's kind of a, a quick way of doing it. Now, looking back, you said, you know, it was kind of a conscious choice. How was it kind of over time, over the years, you just became a bit more and more like particular about your eating and it, and it would have kind of kept going that had in that direction had your running been going well or not? Or do you think it was kind of a control issue that came about in that final four years as you kind of grasped at straws trying to figure out what was going on? Yeah, I think I, I was able to get, be more disciplined in those last four years Mm -hmm. and which is a good thing, but it can be used in a bad way, you know, Mm -hmm. which is true. I think those characteristics, like it can play out good or bad. And in that situation, like being disciplined and not having those two week binge periods and, you know, putting on a bunch of weight and taking all that time off, um, that's, it came back to bite me that my body never got to reset recharge. So, you know, my normal just kept getting lower and lower and lower. So rather than like getting down to race weight at 137 pounds and then going back up to 147 pounds, I was just like, Oh, I'd be at 137 Mm -hmm. well off that. And then go down even more from there to like 133 for the next marathon. And that one would go bad, but I think I just need to get a little leaner, a little lighter and use my self discipline, you know, and, and then I'd go down to like 130 and then my next marathon goes even worse, you know? So I don't know, I guess you could say maybe that's like a control thing. Like you're control, obviously controlling food intake and, and, uh, and your weight, but it was, yeah, kind of more of a conscious choice, you know, being like, I, I'm going to see, like, I'm going to see what the limits are of how lean and light I can get and if it's beneficial or not. And what would you say to someone listening, be it a pro runner, be it a recreational runner who is think in that mindset of, you know, things have been going great. But like I said, if I can just get a little bit leaner, if I can lose some weight, then maybe I'll run faster. What would you say? I'd say find your own sweet spot, you know, like looking back on my career, like it was race after race. I'd race really well at 137, but I, I couldn't be 137 the whole year, kind of like I was talking about. But if I would have just known that and stuck with that and being like, this is based on performances, this is the my race weight, you know, and I encourage runners do the same thing. It's like, if you get lighter and you race worse, then you need to like put some weight back on, you know, and get stronger. But what about that period where you might lose some weight, you might run well we, on this, uh, Rennie, the dietitian we had on a few weeks ago, she said, you know, people might get a few races out of themselves where they run better and then it kind of crashes, but by then they don't see the correlation. Does any part of you wonder if you would have run faster had you had more fuel and been you know been around 150 or do you think that was just you know just not going to work for you I kind of think that this and and this is how what I tell my athletes now is like don't worry so much about weight just focus on like fueling yourself properly and I think that was a big mistake I was making is I was going I was going to bed super hungry. I was waking up in the middle of the night, super hungry. And I was just ignoring those signs. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, I'm not listening to my body. Mm-hmm. I think if you're listening to your body year round and you wake up in the middle of the night and you're hungry, you're going to bed and you're hungry, like eat some food, like listen to your body. That's what I would tell runners, you know, and then let your weight kind of find its, its own sweet spot. Like your body should be able to find its sweet spot. Okay, great. Thank you. And then, so when you did decide to step away, you decided, okay, I'm ready for this new phase in my life because of getting to that point did any part of you struggle with gaining weight once you stopped and is that kind of how you ended up in the lifting end because it was kind of gave you a new goal but the other direction like how did how did you handle that um with uh you know going from lean light fast to okay I'm not trying to be lean light fast anymore yeah it it kind of worked well with my personality I'm kind of a person of extremes in general. And so I'm always trying to find, be better at getting balanced because I'm not naturally good at that. Um, so yeah, it was very much just like going to the opposite spectrum and, and also too, like I was just addicted to seeing the results and mm-hmm. seeing change. My body was like super satisfying and lifting more weight. Like just, it, it's, it's a, 
an amazing feeling to pick something up and be able to, you know, squat down and get it back up after failing, like for months on end, you know, so I was kind of addicted to that sensation, but I also feel like it was a bit of a healthy choice that I needed to make too, where, you know, with the way things ended, you know, running is so catabolic, like it just strips your body of everything it doesn't need to run, you know? And it's so hard on your system, as we talked about previously, that I needed to do something anabolic and give back to my body just to start feeling better and like day to day walking around and energy. And so that's, that was one of the reasons why I went to the weight training, but it was like interesting kind of transitioning over to trying to gain weight. Um, because there's definitely like those moments where I'm like, man, I feel like a lot softer on my abs before, you know? getting frustrated with that and being like, Oh, I need to try and lose some weight, you know? Um, but I've kind of just gotten comfortable in my own skin now. And, and I, you know, it's fun though. I, I like trying to get, to get bigger and stronger and experience the other extreme mm-hmm. of being a endurance athletes that's, you know, super strong endurance wise, but weak as anything yeah. <laughs> when it comes to gym work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's good to hear you say that because I think others listening may, you know, um, feel the same way and that maybe, maybe like you said, it's time where their bodies are kind of saying, all right, I've had enough, or maybe they're just slowing down and they need something else to add into their life that you can find other things to kind of bring joy. And, um, even if you're not kind of staying at the weight you were before, if you're someone that uses running to, to stay, you know, to, to maintain your weight, then that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing if you kind of can't, don't keep that direction as much. Now, with that being said, you, you mentioned how much you're enjoying the lifting. Um, this is a question from Ken who wants to know with, with this journey that you've kind of gone on from, from speed to, to strength, um, what would you recommend to people about running and lifting? Did, were you someone that lifted and would you change it? Had you gone back? Yeah, I would change it. Um, I did lift throughout my career, but I really didn't focus on it very mm-hmm. much. Like, and my heart just wasn't in it, you know? And so like, even though like what my coaches were prescribing was good weights, like my goal was always to get in and out of the weight room as fast as I could, you know? And like, I didn't even believe it was probably helping very much, you know, which is why I want to just get in and out of there. Yeah. Um, but I think having experienced the lifting that I've done now and having kind of read more research on it, like I, without a doubt, it helps, you know, I don't think, I think you still need to keep the main thing, the main thing and focus on your running. And, but I think you can accomplish a, a ton with just two days a week, at 40 minutes a pop, and you don't need to be doing a whole bunch of different excerpts. I mean, it just depends how much time you have, but you can get a lot done with like four exercises. So like when I prescribe my athletes training, it's like three to four exercises, four sets in there in and out of the weight room fairly quick, quickly, you know, cause yeah. I know that's a big deterrent for like me, even as a pro runner, it's like, I'm hungry. I want to go home and eat. I don't want to like be in the gym a long time, you know? And so if, if you don't have a big daunting, um, list of lifts you have to do, it's a lot easier to mm-hmm. just in and out of there. But, um, I'd say to answer your question, some of the lifts that I'd incorporate more of the biggest one is hex bar deadlift. Um, I'm a huge, huge fan of that. And, uh, Ryan, I'm blanking on his name. He used to work at Nike or maybe he's currently at Nike, um, has done a ton of research on that. Listen to a podcast where he talked about it. I will get you to tell me that to put a link in the show notes to Ryan Flaggerty. Flaggerty. Okay. I've heard of that name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did a ton of research to see like what lifts actually correlate to being faster. And there was no correlation between like squats, front squats, deadlift. But the one that he did find there was a correlation between running and lifting was hex bar deadlift. Is that the same and, as trap bar deadlift? Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. Yep. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's the one. And he said that I think in his interview, he had Meb doing that before he won either Boston or New York. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've felt a huge difference in my legs since getting a lot more power and getting a lot stronger. Like I can't, I'm not very good at endurance stuff, but like, I love like doing hill sprints and short Mm -hmm. sprints. Like Mm -hmm. I feel like a sprinter now, like I'm so much more (laughs) So I think, you know, runners can kind of tap into that a little bit by just, uh, hitting that one lift in particular, you know, twice a week 
for four sets can make a huge difference. Okay. So that's, one, that's one of my favorites. Um, also like, like half squats, um, because full squats, like I got injured before the Beijing Olympics, mm. just kind of tweak um in my knee like the top where it connects to the patella doing like full Mm -hmm. butt down squats and i was like man that was so stupid to like get banged up in the weight room you know um so but it is a good movement Mm -hmm. i think just runners have a really hard time getting into that position because they're so tight so that's why i really like i like half squats a lot okay great thank you for explaining those and i'm just gonna throw this out there to anyone listening if you are going to start doing something like x bar deadlift trap bar deadlift make sure you guys see someone to to make sure you're doing correct form it is so easy to tweak your back if you are doing that incorrectly so be sure to go find someone who can teach you to do it properly before you start trying to do it on your own just want to so now I've tweaked my back more times than I can count (laughs) and that's even having a strength coach standing there watching me so just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and that's my own fault, not his. Uh, okay. Finally, I just wanted to ask you about the world marathon challenge. Um, tell us about how that kind of came about and, and how that with your expectations of running seven marathons, seven continents, seven days, how did that compare? Oh, that was such an amazing experience, um, to kind of book in my career with, Mm. uh, so I'd already retired. I was in the weight room and my buddy, uh, uh, pastor Matthew Barnett, he's the pastor at the dream center in Los Angeles. He texted me and he's like, Hey, I'm doing this crazy race, seven marathons, seven days, seven continents. And it was kind of like the same feeling that I had when, before I got into running where like I was hating to run, I was running as little as possible. Um, was in the weight room into that, but there's something about it that just kind of grabbed me, you know? And so I was like, man, I would love to like join him on that. So I texted him right back. I was like, Hey, I should have talked to my wife first. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, if you'd like company, like I'd love to join you, you know? And sure enough, like he texted back, he's like, yeah, let's do it. And there, you know, just all, all went from there. And, yeah. um, I, I, I chose like not to train for it. Um, I was like, man, I, I just, I, like I said, I was into strength training and I was like, I'll just muscle through this week of marathons and, and uh, see what I can do. Um, but it was an interesting experience as I went throughout the challenge, having only done eight mile long run and my mileage was probably like 20 miles a week in the last three months leading up to the competition. Um, but I was actually training myself into shape. So I, I think my first marathon in Antarctica, I don't remember the time off the top of my head. I think it was like three twenty or something like that. Um, but just kept they kept getting faster and faster. Day five in Morocco was my fastest one as like two, three Oh four, three Oh six. I don't remember. <laughs> um, and then that day I got a stress reaction in my hip. So I had to run the last two with the stress reaction, which was confirmed later to MRI and during the time I didn't know it was a stress reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that last marathon in Sydney was, the longest, most painful run I've ever done in my life. I was going to say, how did it, that compare to previous marathons being in a pain from an injury, you know, and, and a stress reaction of all things. It's just not like it's something that warms up. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> like I said, I didn't know what it was. So I was trying to get like massage during the race and I was doing all kinds of different stuff, but nothing was helping, you know, it's just, it was like that searing pain that takes your breath away, like every single step. Um, so it was just a different kind of pain, you know, like usually the pain I was accustomed to was like this full body, like mm. burning pain. And this was like, like someone stabbing you with a knife in your hip kind of pain. Mm-hmm. And it was, just, it just lasted so long. I, just yeah. felt like I was out there for days because it took me five and a half hours, I believe to run that last quote unquote, run that last marathon. There was a lot of walking that, that took place, but so now you have a lot more respect for all the, the, three, four, or four, five, six, seven hour marathoners who are out there, uh, doing their races. Cause it's not yeah. as, uh, it's a, it's a different experience to what you would have probably expected, you know, going from, you would probably, I made the mistake before of thinking that, oh, I'm only out there for two and a half hours or well, I'm out there for two and a half hours, but I'm pushing myself way harder. But coming back from taking my time off, I noticed that actually it's a lot harder mentally and physically to be out there for, for longer time periods than it is to, to be quick and get, get it done. <laughs> Absolutely. I have so much respect for, yeah, three, four, five hour marathoners. Uh-huh. It's amazing that they can persist for that long. You yeah. Know? 
Well, there you go, guys listening. You have a uh, kudos and respect there from Ryan. And uh, we're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and we'll be back with the Running Through All Four. I was excited to introduce you to Aftershocks in that mind-blowing episode with Ray McClanahan a few weeks ago, and I'm really thankful to Aftershocks for sponsoring this episode. I've heard from many of you just how much you loved your Aftershocks, and now I can definitely see what all the fuss is about. In fact, I've been wearing them for all my long runs in training for the Boston Marathon. They're so comfortable that I don't feel the need to rip them off and rub my ears as they hurt as soon as I click stop on my watch. You barely notice they're there, really. I also love that you hear your music or you're running for a podcast or I suppose any other podcast you listen to through the bone conduction technology. I wasn't sure I'd be a fan of that, to be honest. Vibrating through my cheekbones, that sounded like a recipe for me feeling dizzy, but I was wrong. Not only did I feel no dizziness whatsoever, but I absolutely love the fact that I can hear my music or podcast while also hearing sounds of the environment around me. I feel safer and I feel like crossing the road isn't risking my life every time and I can hear the sounds of nature you know the good parts of actually being out on a run that we can easily miss when we have in-ear headphones as a running for a listener you can get $50 off a Trex titanium endurance bundle at tina.aftershocks.com that's t-i-n-a dot a-f-t-e-r-s-h-o-k z or z whichever you prefer dot com and go see what all the buzz is about get yourself a pair april already that means it is marathon month for me and many others i'm excited to be using you can to fuel me through the boston marathon and i've been practicing with it and i love that i never get any stomach upsets something i cannot say with any other fuel i've used and I have eaten a Yukan bar every day, usually the peanut butter chocolate, because who doesn't like that combination? And it really does taste like a sweet snack. It's not something you have to choke down. I just love eating them. And I take the Cran Raspberry Yukan before my workouts and long runs. And then some days the vanilla protein powder is perfect for those days I have to jump straight back into mum mode and chase my daughter around. Yukan Energy Powders and Bars are powered by Super Starch, which is a patented slow low release carbohydrate which means steady long lasting energy no crashes no spikes which is exactly what you want in running right you can save 15% on all you can products with code tina muir at generationyoucan.com all right ryan four more questions for you starting with one piece of advice you would like to give the listeners for their life well, what, kind of what I've built my life around is just loving God and loving other people, and just mm -hmm. keeping it that simple. Mm -hmm. um, I fall back on that over and over again. Yeah, love that. Thank you. All right. One person to follow on social media and why, and I'm thinking I might exclude you from adding, no. from saying oh. Sarah. So <laughs> you, should, you can go follow first. Sarah anyway, listeners, but just give us someone else. <laughs> <laughs> um... Mike Wardian's a pretty interesting guy to follow. He's on the Marathon Challenge and does all kinds of crazy adventure running. Pretty inspiring. Okay, good choice. Yeah, Mike Wardian. We'll put a link in the show notes with his social media if you don't already follow him. How do you want to be remembered on this podcast? Hopefully someone is uh, that encourage a lot of people on his own journey, you know, and uh, and and help people. That's, yeah. That was really kind of the point of, of this whole thing for me was to help other people through my running. Love that. And finally, um, a running for real moment. This is something that only runners will get. The rest of the world has no idea what this would be like. So can you share something with us? <laughs> yeah. So in the 2007 Olympic trials, um, I'd go to the bathroom really bad on the starting line. And um, so the race starts and like I just had to go pee, luckily. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, every runner's worst nightmare, you know, yeah. it's like, you don't want to be in the marathon and like have to hit a port or John along the way, especially if you're trying to make an Olympic team, like mm -hmm. that's not going to help things, you know? Yeah. Um, so I remember being that first couple miles and I was uh, trying to like relax enough to like just go to the bathroom yeah. on myself, yeah. but I couldn't do it. It was such a crazy experience. Like I just couldn't, you know? And then like, I don't know what happened. Like it just like the sensation just evaporated huh. completely. To the point to where like, by the end of the race, like I didn't even have to go to the bathroom afterwards. It's like, how does that happen? I don't know. <laughs> Looked like the water had been like sucked back up. <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't know, but that, I, I definitely know what you're talking about. I've had that happen before, but thank you for sharing that. It's definitely a running for real moment. All right, Ryan, how can people find out more about you? There will be a link to your book, Run the Mile You're In, Finding God in Every Step. How else can people find you if they want to follow along in the future? Yeah, you can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram. My handle is Ryan Hall three. And then also my wife and I, Sarah and I have a website, uh, Ryan and Sarah Hall.com. Okay. Check us out. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us, for being real with us and just, you know, being the role model that you've been to so many of us for, for what we can accomplish. So thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. Once again, my friends, we were able to get the real side out of someone who at times seemed like a superhuman who just didn't have any flaws. I just love that my guests are so real with us and it's just good for us to hear that they too struggle with things and look back and wonder how life could have been different, why they did that certain thing or whatever it may be. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Ryan. His book, Run the Mile You Are In, is available in a few weeks, but you can go pre-order it. There are links to that and everything else we talked about in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 105. And remember to let me know if you are planning on coming to the meetup in Boston on April 14th. We have over 100 people interested in coming, so I really hope to meet you there. Send me an email, tina at tinamuir.com to hear more. And next week, my sports psychologist, Evie Saventi, is back on the show to answer your questions. Yes, your questions, not mine. I asked the Real Sun- Running for Real Superstars community for questions to ask Evie, and boy, did you come through. If you are worried about the mental side of running and how to be better, this one is one you are not going to want to miss. If you're confused about what the heck I mean when I say superstars and you're a newer listener, come join us. It's free and you can find it at tinamuir.com forward slash superstars. You will love it. Truly the most supportive, wonderful place on the internet. Have a wonderful week, my friends. I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.